across the Golden Gate to keep out enemy submarines. And in these emplacements, they had gigantic coastal guns, and they had all of the surrounding hills so heavily fortified that this was actually called the Gibraltar of the Pacific. Now think of the ferry building with 100,000 people passing through it every day to a fleet of 45 ferry boats making 170 daily Transbay crossings and a man-made island built for a party right in the middle of the bay where huge flying boats, perhaps the most glamorous aircraft ever built, took off from the Orient. And imagine Sausalito with a shipyard so big that 34 tankers and freighters were being built at the same time. Or Richmond with even bigger yards, a population of 100,000 and the biggest Ford plant on the West Coast. Think of this as the place where tens of thousands of kids said goodbye to America. And the lucky said hello to them. Now I'm Russ Conklin. And I'm inviting you to relive or maybe perhaps discover for the first time the most dramatic decade of our century. It's a story of heroism and foolishness and of innocence lost and some hard lessons learned. But mostly, this is a story of change. Change in our land and in our lives and in the way we see ourselves. This is the first of five programs and each documenting how a world at war remolded the place where we make our home. Europe in flames. Asia, torn, blood. The Axis powers on the march. 1939. The Axis. Nazi Germany under the command of Adolf Hitler. Fascist Italy led by Benito Mussolini. Imperial Japan ruled by Emperor Hirohito. Just two years ago, in 1937, they signed their pact for world domination. But even before signing, their military ambitions are up. In 1931, Japan seizes Manchuria. 1933, Japan occupies Mongolia. 1935, Italy attacks Ethiopia. 1936, Germany occupies the Rhine. 1937, Japan invades China. And within the year, much of the Chinese mainland is conquered. 1938, Germany annexes Austria. Hitler enters Vienna as a hero and goes on to dismember Czechoslovakia. And now, 1939, the Nazis sign a treaty with Stalin. Hitler's Wehrmacht rolls into Poland. While on the other side of the globe, the empire of Japan continues to shell, to bomb, to spread the rising sun over more of China. 1939, a world at war. How did the San Francisco Bay Area react to all that? Well, for the most part, just like the rest of the nation, by ignoring it. Instead, we hopped the ferry or we drove across the new bridge and went to the fair. Officially, it was the Golden Gate International Exposition. And looking at it as an event can tell us a lot about ourselves at the end of the 1930s. It reflected an abiding faith in science, in industry, and in what we like to call progress. It was based on hope for prosperity, though it lost money in the long run. Mostly a facade of chicken wire and plaster, the fair seemed much more solid than it was. But while it lasted, it was fun. We wouldn't have missed it for the world. Above all, the fair ignored the harsher realities of that world outside. And for us, here on San Francisco Bay in 1939, ignoring worldly reality was part of the game. It wasn't really that we were callow or callous, naive perhaps, and just a little bit too innocent. But Americans had had enough of reality in the 1930s. The decade had begun in a deep depression. 
Bread lines, soup kitchens, closed factories, the signs that said, no help wanted. The guy who once owned a business down the block was now selling apples in Market Street or pencils and shoelaces outside the ferry building. By 1932, laboring men across the nation had lost patience, if not hope. By 34, they were hopeless and outraged. That summer, Longshoremen demanded a dollar an hour in an honest union. And to get it, they struck the San Francisco waterfront and then the entire West Coast. First fists and clubs, and then tear gas and gunshots on the box. Blood ran red in the streets of San Francisco. That's the way Royce Breyer wrote it in the Chronicle. Two dead, 85 injured in what was to become known as Bloody Thursday. Eleven days later, virtually every unionized worker in the city walked off the job in sympathy. It was the largest general strike in American history. For three days, the city stopped. But labor unrest was not limited to the big city streets. This is Salinas in 1936. The issue? Union recognition in the lettuce fields. Violence ruled the fields and streets for 17 days before the farm workers won recognition. At the same time, a half a continent away, wind and drought were changing the land. Like five generations of Americans before them, Dust Bowl refugees were on their way west to try to make a new start. They had heard of a promised land, and it lay at the end of Route 66. In California, we had learned a new word, oki. It was pronounced first in pity, but soon in derision, and sometimes with hate. Up the Central Valley they came, looking desperately for work in the fields and the orchards. In 1936, California authorities began stopping them at the state line, fingerprinting them, charging them with vagrancy, and dumping them across the border. It was, of course, unconstitutional. But these were not people who were going to go get a lawyer. I thought this is free country. Yeah, it's free country. I'll explain all that to you. You're coming into the country here, you're violating the vagrancy laws, you have no money, you're roaming from place to place, no uh, place of residence, no established residence. There's too many people in here already. A writer from Salinas told their story eloquently. His name was John Steinbeck, and he called it The Grapes of Wrath. A powerful book, a stirring movie. Ain't you gonna look back, Ma? Give the old place a last look? We're going to California, ain't we? All right, then, let's go to California. Well, that don't sound like you, Ma. You never was like that before. I never had my house pushed over before. Never had my family stuck out in the road. I had to lose everything I had in life. Steinbeck won a Pulitzer Prize and later a Nobel Prize. But in much of California in the 1930s, especially in the Salinas Valley, this work caused him to be branded as a dangerous subversive. Meanwhile, this man was churning out stories and plays by the bushel, the gifted Armenian wild man from Fresno, William Sorain. He set his most famous play in a San Francisco saloon. The time of your life is said to be about the joint Izzy Gomez ran at 848 Pacific Street. And the lovable eccentrics who hung out there. And both the play and the subsequent movie were wildly popular. I don't suppose you ever fell in love with a midget weighing 39 pounds. Can't say I have. Well, Soroyan turned down a Pulitzer Prize for the play. He said the award was commercial banality. But his work was just what Americans were looking for at the end of the 30s. A warm, humanistic tale, an escape from the realities of poverty and labor strike, oppression, and the threat of war. Pretty good, eh? I finally did it! By the end of the 30s, we had found a lot of ways to distract ourselves. And in those tough times, we rediscovered this fact. If your concept is wacky enough, someone will pay a dime or a quarter to see it. One of the saddest? Marathon dancing with cash for the couple who could stay on their feet the longest. And one of the strangers, Frank Richards, the human fork. You could hit him in the stomach with a sledgehammer or shoot him with a hundred pound cannonball. All for a fee, of course. 
Some didn't require any more talent than the ability to hit yourself in the head with a board or to sit on top of a flagpole. Meanwhile, all across the country, an enormous effort was underway to get America back on its feet and Americans back on the payroll. Huge public projects were undertaken. We in California had our share. Two of the most spectacular projects in the nation went up right on San Francisco Bay. From the shoreline and from our ferry boats, we had watched the bridges grow for four years. When the Bay Bridge finally opened in 1936, and when the Golden Gate Bridge was finished six months later, the celebrations went on for days and nights. And an even bigger party was already coming. That's why Treasure Island was being built on a muddy shoal in the bay. On that day, when the governor turned the first spade of earth in Treasure Island, the Nazi swastika and the flag of the rising sun were very much in evidence. Few of us realized that we would one day see those flags on a battlefield. In less than three months, incredible victories for the Third Reich. First victim, North. Then Denmark. The Netherlands. Belgium, France, the supposedly invincible Maginot Line, useless. The Nazis are in Paris. Halfway around the world, the Japanese nine-year conquest of China continues. Chongqing, back, bomb, shell, under siege. A city that refuses to die. But this is the question the world asks now as Hitler and his generals look to the north from the coast of France. The Battle of Britain has begun. Yeah, we... Saw it on the newsreels, we heard it on our radios, we read it in our newspapers. You know, we knew that it was coming close in 1940, but we just didn't want to believe it. You know, and there were still many Americans as late as 1940 who honestly believed that we could stay out of war. When they went to the movies, they didn't want to see something like this. It's Hollywood's first anti-Nazi film, made in 1939. It was Confessions of a Nazi Spy. And the isolationists denounced everyone connected with the film as warmongers. The next year, Charlie Chaplin wrote, produced, and starred in The Great Dictator. He was investigated, denounced, and labeled a communist, and worse. Most movie audience like safer themes, and that's what we got. Here in the Bay Area, we were especially pleased to watch ourselves as Hollywood imagined us. Suave, sophisticated, and witty, li like the thin man yet with a romantic and lusty past on the Barbary Coast. Hi, young man. How do you like San Francisco? I think I'm going to like it very much. Well, that's fine. I own it. The Napa Valley filled with colorful, heartwarming folks in. They knew what they wanted. Quake and fire, bigger and grander than the real one. Clark gave them right in the middle of it. What's more, there was Jeanette McDonald to belt out the title song, not just once, but several times. And of course, the classic. Yes, sweetheart? And all through the decade, movies were filled with this. Americans were fascinated by a new breed, the big-time gangster. We had no real crime wars here, where payoffs were prompt, the cops were lenient, and politicians were pliable. Lawyer Jake, the master Ehrlich, said that he could stand on the steps of the Hall of Justice, throw a handful of buckshot, and hit 50 whorehouses. Ironically, the federal government opened its strictest prison for its toughest customers right here in the middle of the bay in 1933. Alcatraz became home to the likes of Al Capone, Machine Gun Kelly, and in the movies, to George Raft and a long string of other cinematic sinners. The fictional gangster had become, if not a hero, at least an appealing anti-hero. 
Bogart, Cagney, and Raft spent a lot of time getting into and breaking out of San Quentin and Alcatraz. And of course, in those days, crime didn't pay. Not booze. So we would have to look elsewhere for role models. And here was a more likely arena. The San Francisco Seals, the finest team in the minor leagues who turned out legends who went on to the majors and the baseball hall of fame. The South American boy from Butchertown, Lefty O'Doul. The hot pitcher from across the bay in Rodeo, Lefty Gomez. And from San Francisco's North Beach, Jolt and Joe DiMaggio. Joe was just 21 when he went on to the Yankees in 1936. By 39, the Yankee Clipper was voted the most valuable player in the American League. The same year, he married actress Dorothy Arnold in San Francisco. Joe's parents were immigrants with nine kids. Two of his brothers, Vince and Dom, were also major league ball players. Their dad sailed out from Fisherman's Wharf every day. And across the street, Joe and his brothers opened a restaurant. Joe was living the all-American success story. And a nation that had very nearly lost its confidence it was hungry for heroes like Joe in 1940. And there were others. On the gridiron, Frankie Albert was a classic college football hero, leading Stanford to victory in the Rose Bowl of 1940. Speaking of heroics, there was that Cattle fan who just couldn't stand watching Michigan thrash the Golden Bears in 1940. The Berkeley booster ran out of the stands and he tried to tackle all-American halfback Tommy Arnold. But it was a little Catholic school in Moraga that dominated football through the 30s, the galloping gales of St. Mary's. They regularly beat every top team on the coast. And when they traveled east to beat teams like Fordham and Southern Methodist, the fans followed them on a chartered train that they called the longest bar in the world. The winner of still champions, Max Baer. The irrepressible Max Baer was billed as the Livermore Butcher Boy. When he met Max Schmeling, the man called the fighting pride of Nazi Germany, Baer made a double political statement. He wore a Star of David on his trunks, and he knocked Schmeling out in the tent. But taking a shot at Hitler in the sports arena was applauded by Americans in the 30s. If sport fans were ready to take sides against Nazis, some members of polite society were not. Hitler's Third Reich was represented in San Francisco by German consul Fritz Wiedemann. He was proposed for membership in the Burlingame Country Club, he was a valued guest at the most glittering society parties of 1939 and 1940. It would be another year before Captain Wiedemann would be labeled a Nazi spy and summarily booted out of the country. To the Jewish controlled press, as a creature with horns, a cloven hoof, and a long tail. The Nazis were not without their supporters, defenders, and apologists. The loudest? the German-American Bund and the Ku Klux Klan. For years, they had been wrapping up Hitler's racial theories and American neutrality in a package disguised as patriotism. And there were the America Firsters, who appeared more respectable, like Charles Lindbergh. In the future, we may have to deal with a Europe dominated by Germany. The experience of the past two years has proven beyond doubt that no nation can appease the Nazis. And the man on the street in 1940? Fine our own business. By all means, no. Yes, fine, no, no. Yes. If my country calls, yes. No. But now, time and events were moving too fast for indecision. The Monterey set sail from San Francisco to pick up refugees fleeing the Japanese invaders in Asia. All aliens were commanded by law to register with the federal government. An embargo was placed on the sale of scrap metal and oil to Japan. The Japanese, who had imported it for their war machine for years, made a last-ditch rush on scrap and oil in San Francisco and every other United States port in the Pacific. We looked at our armed forces, and what we saw was pitiful. Over great opposition, Congress passed the first peacetime draft in United States history. 16 million of us registered for service. Meanwhile, America had begun to rearm, and defense plants were springing up all over California. And so were new army barracks. On the radio, there was the voice of Edward R. Murrow from London. This 
is Trafalgar Square. The noise that you hear at the moment is the sound of the air raid siren. A searchlight just burst into action off in the distance. One single beam sweeping the sky above me now. Now, bundles for Britain were more popular than cocktails with the German consul. And in September, the first draft number was selected. The result could not have been more ironic. The first number drawn by the Secretary of War is serial number 158. Among those very first draftees, a Japanese-American flower grower from San Lorenzo, Toshio Okado. A Chinese-American laundry worker from Oakland, Kwong Fong Fu. The senior class president from the University of San Francisco, William Bernard Perlman. And in Palo Alto, an ambassador's son, a young undergraduate at Stanford, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Words spoken earlier by President Roosevelt now had even greater meaning. This generation of Americans has a rendezvous with destiny. Lights were turned out at Treasure Island for the last time. I guess we all knew the, the way of life was ending for us as well. We didn't want to admit it, of course. We really loved the place in which we lived, and, and we resented change, and yet we already knew that it would never, ever be the same. The Santa Clara Valley, fragrant with orchards and canneries and fruit processing plants were the great industries of San Jose. And this was called the Valley of Heart's Delight, where proud, self-contained little towns hugged the edge of the bay. And the larger communities were secure in the American values that seemed self-evident in their time. And yes, even San Francisco, small, elegant, the city that was always changing, we knew it was changing once again. We knew we would miss the place that it had been. I'm Russ Cotton. This program will be repeated tomorrow afternoon at 4.30. The next episode of Remembrance of War will be presented one week from tonight at 7.30.